Welcome to our virtual service again here at Castlefields uh, Church. Sunday 19th of July uh, 2020 and this is a special weekend at our Sunday School Sunday and uh, that uh, is something we mark out each year at Castlefields Church at this time of the year, the last Sunday uh, of the term. We're going to pray together to begin. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, as we come into your presence again this morning, we come to thank you and praise you for this wonderful privilege that we have to come into the presence of an eternal and holy God. And how, Lord, could we come apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth and the life? And we come in him and through him, pleading his merits and righteousness and knowing, Lord, that uh, through him we have access to you, our great and holy God. So please help us today, Lord, we pray in our services, in this day at home, as we worship you. And if others are with us, please bless uh, us together and all your people across this nation and across this world today. So we come to you and ask the forgiveness of all our sins and ask, Lord, that you would help us now to worship you in spirit and in truth in all that we do. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, the, the children uh, love to sing. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Ten thousand reasons. We're going to sing that now. It's on the sheet that's been sent out to you uh, or on the notes page of the website. So just pause this recording now uh, to sing that or read those words through. I'm going to read some verses from Acts chapter 13. We're going to read from Acts chapter 13 and verses 42 to 52. And a little while later on in the service, we're going to read the remainder of chapter 14. Please turn with me then to Acts chapter 13 and verse 42. A reminder that we're in Antioch. We're halfway round on Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey. And uh, here at Antioch, Paul has preached his first missionary sermon. And here is the reaction, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and they came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Well, it is a special weekend, isn't it, boys and girls and young people? We would normally have a picnic on Saturday, uh, and then we'd have our service here on a Sunday or for Sunday School Sunday. And it's just such a shame, isn't it? We can't do those things, but uh, God knows. And so here we are in this virtual way, having our, our special service. 
uh, Nikki has sent a, a letter to uh, to you all, uh, and I know you've got that. And uh, also, she sent to you some uh, bookmarks. Now, uh, I've got them here. Um, here's one for uh, one for Elias uh, and Caleb. Are you out there? Can you can you see that? That's yours. Uh, and, and Janie, Janie, haven't seen you for ages. There's your bookmark. And Stanley, hiya, Stanley. Uh, well, I could go through them all. We've got lots of children, young people here in our Sunday school, uh, which we're so grateful to God for. Uh, and each one of them uh, has got a voucher uh, for a book which has been sent to them. Well, to your mum and dad anyway. So get your mum and dad to buy you a really good book so that you can read it. I was having a look, see what I've got here. You know, these trailblazer books, they're really good. There's one here about Hudson Taylor, one about Martin Luther, uh, one about John Wesley. You can, you can read those. They're especially written for, for children, uh, for you to understand and read yourselves. And uh, boys and girls, you young ones, have you ever read The Tangled Secret? You need to read that. And the Narnia stories, there's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Fantastic, really, really good books to read. If you're older, uh, then I've had this for years. Uh, the Top 100 Questions. Well, you may be getting into teenage years now, uh, and you might have lots of questions. Well, you could buy a book like that, couldn't you, to answer some of the questions that maybe you have. Uh, and then you older boys, uh, here's some books for you. Look, War and Grace, War and Faith. Stories about how people were converted, became Christians in the war. And uh, you learn about the Second World War at school, I'm sure you do, or in your homeschooling. Uh, you learn about that, but learn about what amazing things that God did in people's lives in those days. You know, it's difficult today, isn't it? The coronavirus and so on, it was very difficult in those war years. But God is still at work. And that's what we as boys and girls, and young people, and all of us need to remember. So use those vouchers well. Uh, won't you get mum and dad to get you a, a, a good book? Each week there's some things going out on WhatsApp uh, to the young ones. There's some choruses today for you to sing. So you could sing those at home as well. We want this to be very much as uh, like a normal Sunday school Sunday service. I'm going to be talking to the grown-ups uh, and all of us as well. So listen in later on, and, and there's a sheet for you to complete. And Anna's already done this. She checks my sheets out each week to make sure that uh, it all works. So if you're doing those, I hope you're learning about the Book of Acts uh, with mum and dad and with all of us. Now, we want to thank Nikki and the team who do Sunday school and have been sending out things, Nikki and Sarah have been sending out things to you all, been doing the kids' sea news and everything else. We thank God for everyone who helps with our young people and with the YPAC meetings as well, junior and senior. It's going to be one more of those each before the end of term. We need to pray, don't we, so that God might hear us and bless us as children and young people. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you uh, for being young. We thank you, Lord, for uh, being children, many children uh, growing up in uh, Christian homes, and mum and dad are Christians, and we thank you, Lord, for that. And we pray, Lord God, that these, as these books are purchased and read, that you would uh, bless our children, Lord, and through all the materials that they have, even through the things that they're singing, uh, together at home. Lord, please, we pray, bless young hearts and may young ones come to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. Thank you for the privilege we have today, having so many resources available to us. And thank you for our Sunday school. Thank you for our young people's meetings, Lord. Uh, please help us in the future and bless us as we seek to uh, speak of our great God and our saviour to our young ones. Bless the families at home. Lord, we pray today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, boys and girls, there is a, a, a talk for you now. Um, that normally comes out on WhatsApp, but we're hoping to do that on video uh, in these next few weeks. And it's my turn uh, this week. Uh, so what's my favorite book? Of all the books uh, that I've talked about, what's my favorite book? I think there'd be some hands up if we were in church. Uh, you know it, don't you? It's this one, isn't it? Pilgrim's Progress. And who wrote Pilgrim's Progress? Well, I'm sure there'd be some hands up. It's a man called John Bunyan, isn't it? John Bunyan. There's so much we could talk about about John Bunyan. Uh, but I'll tell you what happened to him when he was 15 and a half years old. Now, I say 15 and a half because at 16, you could join the army. And if anything John wanted to do was to join the army. There was a war going on in his day when he was that young. And he wanted to join the army, not to fight some foreign uh, country, but a war in this country. You might have heard it between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers. Strange names, aren't they? And he wanted so much to be in the army of the Roundheads, fighting for that cause. You couldn't join till he was 16. You know what he did? He lied. Oh, dear. He wasn't a Christian at that point. We should never lie, should we? But he lied and he got in the army. But, you know, God has a wonderful way of working. And in the army in those days, 1643, it was a long time ago, in the army, you were given something. Was it a helmet? Yes, you probably had a helmet. Uh, was it a sword? Maybe a sword. Was it a musket? A similar sort of thing to a gun. Could have been. Some boots? Yes, yeah, yeah. But no, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is what every soldier was given in the Roundhead Army. Here it is. It's called the Soldier's Pocket Bible. That would have been bound a bit uh, differently to this. This is a, a printed version today. But every soldier in that army, John Bunyan included, was given one of these. And they were told to read them. And then they were told to put them in a special place. Here's where they put them. They had to put them in this pocket here, right against their heart. So that the soldier's heart was his Bible. Not all the Bible, but some verses to encourage those soldiers, especially those soldiers who were Christians. You know, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, didn't he? And in that story, there's a time when Christian and his friend Hopeful, they're on the journey. It's a picture of the Christian life. But it was so hard. It was so difficult. And they looked over the wall and they saw that there were some easier paths. They climbed over the wall. They went out of the right way and over the wall into Bypath Meadow. So much easier there. But it wasn't the right way. Well, the story goes on and they're captured and they are put into prison by a giant, a giant called despair. Despair is when you're so sad and so unhappy and so desperate, you don't know what to do. And they're in his castle and they're being told that tomorrow they're going to be killed. What will they do? Well, we read in the story that suddenly Christian went what a fool I am, hopeful. In my pocket here, in my pocket, I've got, what's that? I've got a key. I've got a key. <laughs> How amazing was that? They found that the key opened the door of the prison and it let them out. Well, John Bunyan, by using that picture of a key, was remembering that when he was young, when he was only 15 and a half, he was given this. That was in his pocket, wasn't it? Part of the Bible. And the Bible is the key to open up life. The key to open up the way to heaven. The key to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The key out of despair. You know, boys and girls, some people today, they're despairing. They don't know what to do. This coronavirus and everything else has caused so many problems for them. And you might be a bit frightened, too, and a bit worried. Well, here's the answer. John Bunyan put it into Christian's 
pocket because he remembered that the Bible is like a key. It's like a key which opens the door for us to know the Lord Jesus as our saviour, to know the way to heaven. The Bible's so important. I hope you'll always remember that. Remember about John Bunyan. And I hope you'll read Pilgrim's Progress. Because after the Bible, I think it's the best book. The best book in the world. Well, we're going to read some more now in Acts chapter 14. And this time Ben is going to read for us. We're going to read from Acts chapter 14 right through to the end of the chapter. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Let's read God's word together. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leapt and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Saul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran out, ran in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, whom bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every city and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Poseidon, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah, and from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time, 
with the disciples. Have in front of you, will you, Acts chapter 13 and 14. Uh, we're in the middle of those chapters. We're on mission. We're on mission with Paul and Barnabas. And for a time, remember last week, John Mark is with the two of them until Acts chapter 13 and verse 13. And Acts 13 and 14 describe Paul and Barnabas' missionary journey, the first of Paul's missionary journeys. It lasts for two years, and it covers, we said last week, about 1,500 miles. Your task, your task in this mission as we go through it, is to read through Luke's travel log and to follow through the places and all the things that happen from Antioch to Antioch via Antioch. And we've said you need a map, really. Well, there's a map for you in the children's notes. You can, you can look at those uh, and uh, it's there for you. My task is to draw out the application. So we can't look at every verse. We're not looking at every part. As you read through, you'll see we won't cover everything. But we want to draw out the practical principles for us on mission at Castlefields Church today. We began last week with three initial principles. I hope you remember those. The first was calling, uh, calling established. Every Christian is a full-time Christian, but God calls as he did with Paul and Barnabas, he calls men and women too to serve him in specific ways. The church is to separate uh, those who God calls, send them and support them. Separate, send and support for mission work. Now, mission work may be here in this country, but it may be abroad. But it's a, a work which God calls some specifically to. And then secondly, we saw opposition, the pattern of calling, but then the pattern of in the mission, there's opposition. Wasn't long, was it, before opposition arose? A man called Elimus, that sorcerer, who sought to turn away the Roman proconsul of Cyprus from the gospel. We're going to think more about opposition later on. And the third principle was the principle of preaching being the priority. So calling first and then opposition arises. But whatever happens, preaching is the priority. Very significant thing we saw, didn't we? In Luke 13 and verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they preached. That's a pattern which we'll see all through the missionary journeys. It's a pattern for us to follow the priority of preaching. And we see that though Paul begins his sermon in Antioch, which is recorded here for us, Back in the Old Testament, all that he's preaching about is leading to this, to Jesus, to his death and resurrection, for the need for sinners to know him as their saviour. Chapter 13, verse 23, God raised up a saviour, Jesus, he says. 1339, for by him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law. And we see that preaching, real preaching, mission preaching, demands a verdict. You can't be neutral about preaching, both preaching itself and the hearing of preaching. It demands a verdict. Well, what happened? Uh, what was the reaction? What was the verdict? Well, this is where we start uh, this morning. From verse 42 of chapter 13 and onwards to the end of chapter 14. So what we have here, we have patterns emerging, principles emerging for us. We've had three already. We're going to see some other things today that speak to our uh, approach to what we do at church, what we do in mission here today. Uh, four things today. We're going to consider gospel reception. So Paul's preached the gospel. We're going to think about gospel reception. We're going to think about gospel rejection. Uh, we're going to think about gospel confirmation. And finally, gospel reporting. So let's go through those one by one and follow through in the verses with me. 
chapter 13 and verse 42. First of all, gospel reception. We've said, haven't we, just now that preaching demands a verdict. You can't be neutral when the true gospel, when the Bible is preached in all its fullness. So we find in verse 42, here's the reception. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them again the next Sabbath day. So that's the reaction of the Gentiles. That's their reception. Verse 43, many of the Jews, it says, and the devout proselytes, people who had become Jews, who, who were of the Gentile nations, they followed Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas persuaded them. They had, they had conversation with them, further discussion with them, and they persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Maybe they weren't all that convinced. Maybe they still had lots of questions, but Paul and Barnabas encouraged them to keep asking questions, keep seeking. Well, it resulted in something amazing. The following Sabbath, look at verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Does that happen today? Well, it certainly happened in the history of our country. On a very, very cold, freezing cold February day in 1739, a, a man whose name you may know, George Whitfield, preached to some miners in Kingswood in Bristol. He said about 200 miners had, had gathered to hear. He went back on the Wednesday and there were 2,000 there who were listening. He tells us he went back on Friday, the same week, and 4,000 men had gathered. And then amazingly on the Sunday, he went back on the Sunday afternoon to preach there again, out in the open air. And the miners had brought their wives and friends and others. There was upwards of 10,000 people had come to hear the preaching of God's word. Wouldn't that be wonderful today in our city in Derby if we found that? But you see, there is a reception of God's word. You can't be neutral about the preaching of God's word. Whatever happens today, even young ones, boys and girls, you're going to do something with what we're preaching about. You might do what we see in verse 45, where there's total rejection. I'm going to talk more about rejection in a moment. But if you look at verses 46 to, to 48, Paul told the Gentile hearers that Despite the rejection of the message by the Jews, that the Savior, that the Lord Jesus was for them. And we read in verse 48, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And the end result, verse 49, the word of the Lord spread throughout all the region. And verse 52, there was much joy and evidence of the Holy Spirit among them. I suppose you could say, couldn't you, that the reception of the preaching of the word of God is a mixed bag there, isn't it? And I think that's it. I think that's what happens. There is a mixed bag of reception. It happens over and over again. As Paul goes on in his missionary journeys, some believe. Some say, we'll hear you again about this. Some ask questions. And some reject. There's a mixed bag. Now, I want you to notice this, that Paul is not deterred by this. He doesn't change his message. We do see that he carefully adapts how he starts and the way he approaches his message, whether he's preaching to Jew or Gentile. But he always comes to this one thing, that they're sinners, that Jesus is the only way of salvation, and he preaches Jesus to them. He preaches to all the same gospel. Now, Luke is the inspired historian. We've said that going through, haven't we? We've all said, said he's the inspired storyteller. Uh, and he's the inspired travel log writer. He's not usually the theologian. He's going to leave that to Paul, isn't he, later on? But you see the verse we missed out as we went through is verse 48. And at the end of verse 48, here is Luke being a theologian for us, explaining what's happening here. 
in this mixed bag of reception of the gospel. Look at verse 48 at the end of that verse. Here's the theology of mission reception, gospel reception. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And this tells us two things. It tells us that our task in the mission is to preach the gospel like Paul and Barnabas faithfully to everyone. They preach to Jews and Gentiles, whatever the reception. In verse 46, it tells us that they grew bold in telling the Gentiles because they saw the reception that the Jews gave to this gospel. More and more of the Gentiles were hearing. So our task, like Paul and Barnabas, is to preach the gospel to every creature, that's our command, to be witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's task, he is to bring the gospel into the hearts and lives and minds of those who hear, effectively bringing to salvation those who he has prepared and appointed to eternal life. Paul says, doesn't he, that uh, verse 46, some reject it and, and they almost like they count themselves unworthy of everlasting life. They say, well, we don't want this. Well, Paul has done what he can, hasn't he? He's preached and we must witness and preach as much as we can. And some will reject it. People counting themselves unworthy don't want to know salvation. But some, you see, verse 48, will be glad and God will demonstrate to us all that he has ordained some, appointed some to everlasting life, filled with joy and of the Holy Spirit, verse 52. So here's the lesson for us. Whatever the mixed bag of reception, God will be faithful to his task. You leave the outcome to God. Witness to your friend, tell them of your faith. As we preach the gospel, we do it faithfully, explaining the need of men and women, boys and girls. We do our task faithfully, and God will do his task. He will bring some to salvation. Without a doubt, he has promised to do so. We don't know who is appointed to eternal life, but he does. Leave the outcome to him. Now, in that mixed bag is our second point, gospel rejection, gospel rejection. You see, we see those who doubt, who question and reject the gospel message, and increasingly they oppose it. Look at chapter 13 and verse 49. That's such a positive and encouraging verse, isn't it? The word of the Lord was being spread throughout the region. And we are encouraged as the word of God spreads. We've been encouraged at Castlefields, haven't we? Those of you who are, are with us, you'll know these things, but those watching, perhaps from other uh, places, even around the world, how wonderful God has been to us over these last 10 or 15 years. Numbers have been saved. We've had quite a number of baptisms. Our church building is full to overflowing. In fact, with coronavirus and so on, we can't really go back to our church building. It is too small. And our church membership has doubled over those years. We thank God. We greatly rejoice. We give him all the glory for those things. But we do need to be wise and we do need to be uh, careful and cautioned because when there is progress in the gospel like that. Just as here uh, in Paul's missionary journey, preaching and progress, reception, but rejection and opposition. As we journey with the Apostle Paul uh, through his missionary journeys, we'll see that as the work of God increases, there's almost like a parallel increase in the enmity and opposition of 
those who are set against it. Sent out to those of you who are regulars with us are the hymns for today. And on that hymn sheet, you'll see that there's a chart. Now, that's included in the notes and articles page of the website. You'll see there's a chart there where I've set out for you uh, the progress through chapters 13 and 14. And in those chapters, you'll see there there's a pattern of, of preaching and uh, the reception of God's word and then the journeys of these men. But set intermingled with those things as they go on is the rejection. And you'll see how it begins. It begins in chapter 13 with just one man seeking to turn one man away from the gospel. Elimus seeking to turn Sergius Paulus away from the gospel. But if you look down, if you go through the verses in the chapter, you will see that the opposition gets harder and harsher and more specific and more violent literally as the gospel progresses so does the opposition and it ends with Paul and Barnabas being stoned and Paul so badly stoned that he's almost left for dead in chapter 13 verse 10 Paul refers to the one opposing the gospel as being full of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all righteousness, one seeking to pervert the straight way of the Lord. You see, Paul says that behind Elimus and behind all the opposition is the accuser and the opposer of every one of us and of the gospel mission, the devil himself. So we have to face the reality here, the reality that in mission there is opposition. Now, Paul turns theologian here. Just jump on with me for a moment uh, into chapter 14 and verse 22. Uh, here's Paul, the theologian. They're on their journey back again, which we'll consider in a moment. And as they go back to these churches where there's been uh, the opposition in the towns where they have been, you'll see what he says in verse 14. Sorry, verse 22 of chapter 14. We must, he says, through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. That word tribulation, it means pressures or straits or troubles. And uh, J.A. Alexander, the Bible commentator says, commentator says uh, when it says many, it means not mere quantity or number, but variety. And Paul would say that's exactly it. At every turn, there was opposition of one form or another, an increasing opposition. But Paul, the theologian, says this. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We are entering the kingdom of God. He's referring there to the, the consummation, the final uh, consummation, the future blessedness of the people of God. But entering into the kingdom of God is something that is continuing all the time. When we're saved, we enter into his kingdom. As we grow in grace, we enter into his kingdom. As his gospel is preached and people are saved, the church is built up. The kingdom is being built up. Now, he says there will be tribulations, but we will enter. There's the theology of the rejection of mission. There will be difficulty and trouble, persecution and terrible things even. We see that around the world today, as bad as what happened to the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, his friend. But this is mission unstoppable. Despite the opposition, the mission is on track. And will be completed. So we've seen gospel reception. It's a mixed bag. We've seen gospel rejection. We will, in the end, enter the kingdom. Now let's think about gospel confirmation. We're having to move quite quickly through these verses. It's not a verse by verse exposition, but if you have a look um, in chapter 14 uh, from verses 8 to 20. You'll see there the events, the healing of a lifetime cripple, uh, the reaction of the people of Barnabas and, and Paul are worshipped as gods. And they have to say, no, 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 we are just men like you. And then they're stoned almost to the point of death. But from chapter 14, verse 21, Paul and Barnabas are journeying back. So on the map that you can perhaps look at, you'll see they've come from Antioch. 
They've gone through Cyprus. They've gone up to Perga, to Pamphylia. They've gone to these different cities of Lystra and Iconium and Derby and back again to Antioch. And now they're returning back again. Now, the interesting thing is that in that journey and coming back through those uh, different cities, uh, there's been weeks or, or maybe months that have expired. And they're coming back to establish those that have been saved into churches. It's amazing, isn't it, how brave they are. Seeing the rejection and the violence against them, that they went back again. Such was their love for the gospel and for the church and for those new Christians. Now, it's instructive to see what they did. We're calling this gospel confirmation. So here the gospel has been preached, received, to some extent rejected, but many have believed. Now, what is the pattern that's set for us here? The pattern which should be in our churches, whether they're new churches, existing churches, and our church. Well, God has begun a good work. We're told in Philippians 1 and verse 6 that when God begins a good work, he will complete it. He will bring it to pass. But there is a responsibility on us and a task on us, illustrated by Paul and Barnabas here. Five things are listed uh, in these verses for us as we go on from uh, verse 21 onwards. You find in verse 22, the first thing they do is they strengthen the souls of the disciples. That word means to make firm. It's, it's that sort of process that uh, we would do when we, when we set concrete and, and, and we, we tamp it down and make sure there's no air pockets. So it's absolutely solid and firm uh, when, when it sets. What are they doing? They're explaining the doctrines of the faith. They're, they're, they're laying down foundational truths for these new Christians on their way back home. They're anchoring them into the truth of life, into the word of God. That's part of the task of the church. That's as much mission work as going out and preaching the gospel. So they're strengthening the disciples. Secondly, they're exhorting them. Can you see that? Verse 22, they're exhorting them to continue in the faith. Now, exhorting is, 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 a, is a type of teaching. Uh, it's it's that which um, speaks about the Christian life, daily Christian living, what it is to be a Christian. They're saying to them, keep going. There's so much here in God's word to help you to keep going. So it's not just truth in the mind to solidify and to know. It's life itself lived out, progressing on. So strengthening and exhorting. Keep going on. Keep pressing on. We need that encouragement, don't we? We do encourage one another. Keep pressing on, Christian. These are difficult days, aren't they? Keep pressing on. Well, it brings us to the third thing. They encourage them. Look at the end of verse 22. With, with certainty, they encourage them to keep going on. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. That's what we've been speaking about. Remember, we must enter. We will enter. Don't, don't give up, friends, because there are so many great promises for us. We, we, may, we may feel so concerned and anxious about the present situation. We can't meet as a church. We can't do all the things that we would normally do. But be encouraged. God's begun the work. He's going to continue it. See how important these things were. Here's the fourth thing in verse 23. You see there they appointed elders. So here's the pattern emerging. We mentioned this last week. Uh, back in Antioch, uh, they were prophets and teachers. Uh, that was the description of the leaders of the church. But as things progress, what we see is the pattern emerging of elders and deacons. Deacons have been appointed already in the church in Jerusalem. They may well have been in, in Antioch. 
elders, the principle of elders, those who are pastors, carers of the flock. So some had grown in, in their knowledge and understanding um, more than others. Some men uh, clearly were leaders amongst the, these new churches and they were appointed as elders and, and, and then the church would be helped with godly leadership. And then the fifth thing we see in verse 23 is there was much prayer. And again, we've seen it before, there was prayer and fasting. We won't talk about fasting in detail, but what it tells us is this, that when there's extreme times, it's not just prayer, it's prayer and fasting. There's, there's a real um, urgency here. There's a real intention here, isn't there, um, to pray, commending them to the Lord. Because these are new Christians and they needed so much prayer. We've got new Christians among us. It is so wonderful to have new Christians at Castlefields Church. And you've been saved, you've been born again. And we're seeking to do all the things that, that's that are happening here in these couple of verses. Encouraging and strengthening you. And we're praying. Pray on for those who have been Christians, become Christians recently. Now, Paul and Barnabas were going to move on, but God wasn't, was he? And he makes promises to us. He says this. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I will build my church. We can rely on him. Those churches began to prosper and grow. We'll meet some of them again in other journeys. Now, all this teaches us this. Mission is out there. Now, that's what we normally think, isn't it? Mission, missionary. Oh, that's out there. That's far away. But no, it teaches us this, that mission is in here as well, in church. So it's much as much part of mission going out as being within and teaching and encouraging and helping. And somewhere there's a role for you. If you're part of Castlefields Church, we're brought together. We are a body. Christ is the head. And just as my hands are moving and my lips are moving and my eyes are, are open, my body is functioning to be able to preach this to you. And the principle is that every one of us has a part in this whole process of mission. There's a work to be done for all of us. Well, here's the fourth thing and the last thing this morning. Gospel reporting. Gospel reporting. It's quite breathtaking, isn't it? These two chapters, 13 and 14. Think how far they've traveled. 1,500 miles. They've been away for a couple of years. Think of everything that's happened to them. It's just quite staggering, really. But they're on their way home. Chapter 14, verses 26 to 28. They're on their way home. Just think of them walking into Antioch. Uh, where they first started, and uh, some of the other Christians seeing them. Wow, Paul and Barnabas, you're home. Oh, tell us all about it. Well, how did they tell them all about it? Well, here's something for us. Chapter 27 and verse 1. Gathering the church. They gathered the church. The church. That's a defined body. The word church is ecclesia. We know that word, don't we? It's the, it's the called out, but called together ones. So on, on Sunday, uh, in normal times, we open our doors and anyone can come in. But we have church members meetings, the church. And this here is the first uh, picture for us of church members gathering together to hear to uh, hear what is happening uh, within the uh, mission of the church. And we find them not only gathering, but reporting, reporting to the church all that God had done. The authorised version, it says they rehearsed. Uh, the Greek word is back announce. So they, they literally got everybody together. They got the Christians together in Antioch. In whatever building it was, somebody's home, large home, or wherever it was, they gathered them together and they said, let's just go back and tell you what's happened since, since what? Since chapter 13, 
and verses 1 to 3. Where there'd been a church members meeting then, separating Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, telling them that they had their support and sending them. Now they're back, the church members are meeting again, and they're reporting all that has happened to them. So here are some things for us for church members' meetings. Planning, thinking ahead. What has God got for us? How is God calling us to go forwards? But then, reporting, reviewing, assessing, rejoicing, and thanking God for everything that's taking place. You see what they said in verse 27. They said how he, how God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas weren't saying, oh, look what we've done. They were saying, this is what God called us to do. You separated us and sent us uh, and you supported us. Thank you so much for praying for us and, uh, and, and the, the money that we were able to take so that we could live on that journey and pay the fare on the boat and all those things. But now we're back and this is what God has done. And that's what a church members meeting is. It's such an important meeting. It's a sad thing. I hear pastors saying that uh, people come to services and other things, but church members meetings are often not well attended. That's not really right, is it? Because here are the, here are the meetings where we plan and prepare uh, for mission things together. And here are meetings where we, we hear reports and we, we review and we assess and we thank God and we press on. What a privilege. What a privilege to be a member of a church. Uh, what a responsibility to be a member of a church. What a joy to be a member of a church. So I may be speaking to you, you may not live in Derby, you may be somewhere, but if you're a Christian, then be part of a church, won't you? Because the pattern's here for us, and the joy of it is here for us. Responsibility of it is here for us, and, and the privilege we have too. So Paul and Barnabas are back home. Verse 28, we've got them back home. It's a time for consolidation. It's a time for continuing. And sometimes in church life, that's what it's like. All the excitement of all the other verses, all the action, all the things that are going on. But verse 28 is a, is a verse which is just a, an ordinary day-to-day -day sort of verse, isn't it? And, and church life is like that. And and we attend a prayer meeting on a, on a Wednesday and listen to the services on a, on a Sunday and seek to witness where God has put us during the week and help and encourage and be a blessing to one another. And it's routine and humdrum, but sometimes church life is like that. But we're on a mission. Don't forget it. We're on a mission. And it's unstoppable. And God is working out his purposes. Or oh, we pray that these events in the book of Acts will will inspire us and help us and be a blessing to us, each one of us. And if you're not a Christian, what mission are you on? We're going to go through tribulation to enter the kingdom of God, to heaven. We know that. Where are you going? What about your life? Now, we're going to sing that last hymn, Go Labour On. Pause the recording and sing that hymn or read those verses through and I will pray at the end. Lord, we thank you for this amazing journey of Paul and Barnabas and all that we learn from it. We thank you for the wonderful gospel preaching of the Apostle Paul and how he centres on the Lord Jesus. And Lord, that would be our our intention in all things that we do, that he might be lifted up and that men and women, boys and girls, on this Sunday school Sunday, boys and girls too, may come to know him and love him and churches may be established throughout the world and our church here at Castlefields may be strengthened and encouraged and blessed. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.